Thank you, Chuck. Um, and good morning, everybody. What I'd like to do is to um, briefly go over a description of C-Image C -Image 1 and then talk a little bit about what we consider our major accomplishments. Uh, C-Image 1 is a global uh, conspiracy or consortium uh, of, uh, of four countries, uh, the Netherlands, uh, uh, Germany, Canada, and the United States, uh, and a, a number of institutions around the Gulf. Um, we are a, a very large group. Uh, current um, enrollment is about 100 and almost 200 people. You can see we have a substantial number of undergraduates that are part of our uh, consortium as well, and we do a lot of internships with undergraduates in terms of doing this. Um, at the conference this week, um, I think our la by last count, um, our uh, participants had uh, 83 posters or presentations, and um, our uh, PIs are co-chairing uh, three of the sessions. Um, uh, as Tamai said, um, we will continue as CMH2, and we're adding five additional um, organizations, including um, the UNAM University in, in Mexico, to our consortium. Uh, and overall, our, um, our goal, our primary goal, our primary mission here is to, to uh, allow society be, to be better prepared uh, to mitigate future oil spills. And, th and that comes in many forms in terms of being a thread that passes through our, our, uh, our consortium. So if we look at the organization of C-Image, um, we are um, divided into six tasks. Uh, you can see from this uh, diagram that we have uh, two modeling tasks, two field-oriented tasks, and two laboratory uh, experimental tasks. Um, the, the tasks are in order, um, the near to far field modeling, which uh, actually interacts quite a bit with uh, t uh, the uh, CARTH uh, uh, as well as the uh, Geyser uh, Consortia. Um, and these are basically try to understand fundamental processes from the wellhead to the sort of mesoscale. Um, secondly is the, the high pressure experimentation, and that, as Tamai said, um, that goes hand in hand with trying to understand these uh, uh, near field dynamics, and it's uh, incredibly important. And, uh, uh, in terms of informing the models. Um, we have a, a task that looks at uh, sedimentary uh, studies, and uh, this is uh, headed up by, um, by Dave Hollander, and of course, you know, that has interactions with uh, the other parts of the ecosystem as well. Um, we have a field program uh, on both uh, mammals and fish. Um, um, John Hildebrand and his students have been studying um, dolphins and beak whales and other um, um, uh, organisms out there, and, and we have a fairly vigorous fish uh, group as well, a toxicology group, and then an ecosystem modeling group. And the point I want to make from this diagram is, number one, we're touching two of the uh, GOMRI uh, priorities, uh, both uh, chemical um, impacts and as well ecological impacts, and that um, there's a lot of interaction. Uh, between these boxes, and, and you know, we try to say in, in our group that we're more than the sum of our parts, and I think that'll come out in, in some of the examples I'll cite, and certainly I would reference some of the uh, many of the papers that you're going to see. Um, so uh, this is a shameless ripoff of uh, Margaret Linen's talk last year at Mobile. So I'm going to do a top ten list of what we think our major accomplishments are. Um, and number ten, uh, what I'll do is I'll do go through these, and then I'll try to back up what I said. Um, so number 10, and this is uh, actually riffing off of what Tam Tamai said, we've helped to demonstrate that the academic community is capable of significant, timely, and impactful response to environmental disasters as, um, as e example, the, the Hercules 265. And we did this um, as, a, as a, a middle out management model. That is, th this was not directed from Chuck or somebody else. This was the consortia directors getting together and saying, hey, can we, can we have a response here? And that's pretty unique. And, and when you think about the organized response that the Coast Guard and knowing other people have to do, because the resources and the people were in place, you know, we could actually organize this, as Tamai said, over, over the weekend in a phone call, right? So um, I'll, I'll cite some of the work that, that we've done on this as well. And uh, you know, I think going forward, you know, because um, of this consor uh, consortia of consortium that we have, that we would be in a, a wonderful position to respond to any ecological events uh, in the future. Uh, number nine, uh, we believe that we've contributed new understanding um, of the Deepwater Horizon spill in the context of other natural and human responsible sources of oil in the Gulf of Mexico, and that is, you know, uh, the deep, deep water horizon in a dirty gulf. Uh, you know, clearly this is a very difficult problem to try to deconvolve, and, you know, as, as uh, Rick Spinrad said, you know, um, the baselines you don't have, you know, it's really hard to try to disentangle what's going on. We think we've made some progress on this, and I'll cite a couple of examples. 
Uh, number eight, we've documented significant impacts of the deep water spill at the organismal, the species, the community, and the ecosystem levels of organization. As we like to say, because our consortium touches so, so much of life, from microbes to mammals. And, you know, if you were involved in some of these workshops yesterday, uh, you know, we were doing a little shuttle diplomacy between large vertebrates and the genomics, et cetera, and, you know, trying to chase down all of the people from uh, CMH that were involved in some of those things. Um, and I'll, I'll cite a couple of examples. Number seven, we've implemented new, um, and what I would call uh, novel uh, analytical tools for understanding sublethal impacts on ecosystem components. And that it ranges from genomic, uh, metagenomic tools, um, a lot of work on isotopes, uh, we're using uh, structures in fish, for example, otoliths and, and eye lenses um, in very novel ways, and certainly the whole range of microbiological tools. Um, you know, the, the, the routine of oil spill response is it is, has been, up until Deepwater Horizon, pretty stagnant in terms of the tool bag. And I think, you know, one of the enduring legacies of, of Gomri is going to be that there's going to be a lot of different tools that people will potentially look at. Number six, we've developed uh, new planning tools to aid in the oil spill response for uh, identification of vulnerable ecosystems. And I'll cite an example of this as well. Now we're getting down to the dirty work here. Number five, um, we've confirmed that surface oil plumes can result from turbulent deep sea oil and gas releases without the addition of dispersants. And I consider this one of the fundamental questions to be resolved by Gomery, and that is, did the deep injection of dispersants um, uh, fundamentally c uh, help create plumes, or was it a knock-on effect? And to, if that's the case, then to what extent? This is a highly controversial area and one that has enormous practical implications in terms of future responses to deep spills. I can tell you uh, from the vigorous debate that we saw in the dispersants workshop yesterday that this is unresolved. Nevertheless, I think we've got a lot of the pieces in place to actually get there. Uh, number four, that we've discovered, documented, and evaluated the occurrence of a significant quantity of Deepwater Horizon oil in offshore sediments. Um, and, you know, our work, as well as the work of EcoGig and, and, and Deep Sea, have stimulated the ongoing MOFSA collaboration, which I also think will be a major accomplishment and, and one that's incredibly novel in terms of the history of oil spills. Number three, uh, and this is uh, where we look beyond the scientific accomplishments into the total footprint. We, uh, we've developed uh, education outreach to a diverse segment of the public and society through things like t the Teachers at Sea program that we've got, uh, podcasts which have reached a, a wide segment of, uh, of different populations in the United States and, and abroad, uh, science cafes, social media, technical presentations, et cetera. Number two, um, uh, we've supported uh, 24 PhDs and 37 master's degree recipients that will contribute to oil spill response science for at least three more decades. And I can tell you, because we're continuing uh, in our, in our uh, consortium, that many of these master's students will go on for PhDs um, supported by Gomery. And number one, I believe that, you know, we and all, frankly, all of the consortia have helped to build a regional to global capacity in oil spill related research that certainly will be an enduring legacy of Gomery. So, um, so can I back up what I just said? I don't know. Um, we'll see. Uh, in terms of the baselines, um, this is, these are some photographs from the, uh, the um, Hercules 265. And um, the, the, so you have a picture of the burning well that occurred in, in July. But um, when we visited in August, we did a variety of things uh, as follow-up. Number one, um, our sampling was directed by the, uh, c the vectors of d drifters that Tamai described. So we sampled primarily to the south and the east, where we think the water was actually going. So we've done things like long lining for uh, the fishes by setting the, uh, if, you, if you notice very carefully, the, uh, the, the, the rig is out here. And so we've set up a long line going five miles out from that and, and looked at the fishes along the line. We've also done coring studies, um, methane and, and microbial studies as well. And I would direct you to a talk by Isabel Romero um, uh, tomorrow in session six on this. Um, this notion of disentangling deep water horizon uh, spill from other sources is a really important one, as I said. And just looking at the map, you can see how difficult this is. I mean, if you look at the yellow dots, those are all the extant uh, oil and gas structures in the Gulf of Mexico, of which there are about 4,000. And the green dots represent uh, Ian McDonald's work of where natural seeps are. And then the, the, the gray cloud is um, deep water horizon. So you can see you've got this admixture of, of potential sources and trying to sort this out in a meaningful way to understand you know, what Deepwater Horizon was contributing represents an ongoing challenge not only to us but to NERDA as well. Right? 
So uh, some of the evidence that we have, for example, um, if you look at um, the graphic on the left, this is a comparison of the, uh, the PAH and alkylated uh, homolog composition of the source oil that Chris Reddy and his colleagues put together. On the right-hand side here is um, um, the same uh, PAHs and alkylated homologs in the livers of red snapper that, that we published on. You can see there's a very close resemblance in comparison to some of the other um, previous studies of of um, PAHs in, in the environment, and this happens to be sediments in coastal Louisiana, where you have a much different and much more aged set of sediments. So we've gone through all of the uh, potential studies that we could find to compare this with, um, with you know, what the deep water horizon looked like, and you know, clearly I think we can start to disentangle some of these issues. So in, in terms of um, uh, some of the other things that have gone on, this is a, a, uh, from the keynote talk that uh, Will Patterson will give tomorrow in session six. One of the issues is, you know, what happened to all this dead carbon that's in the system? And this is kind of an exciting set of graphics. So this graphs um, the uh, delta carbon 13 versus the uh, delta nitrogen 15. And so you can see this sort of hysteresis in the, in the, uh, in the composition of both red snapper and then a whole variety of different reef fishes. And so the, the real question, and you have to wait till you know, um, Will's talk this afternoon, um, have we actually returned to baseline? And you know, can you actually track some of this uh, deep water horizon oil throughout the, the ecosystem? Very exciting set of tools. Um, so I mentioned before that you know um, we we're trying to use otoliths and and islands isotopes um, islands is to try to track something some of what's going on. Uh, the top graphic here represents a, um, basically a otolith sampling from the core of the otolith out to the edge, and you're tracking in this case uh, barium as an element. You can do all kinds of elemental um, compositions here, and what you see is that the the animals um, when they're young have a lot of barium in their otoliths because they're primarily um, up near the river where there's a lot of terrigenous barium. But you also see in 2010, because the, because the otolith is a flight data recorder that's time synced, you can actually figure out, geez, you know, this thing had a barium um, spike. And so, you know, looking for all the potential elements that might be in either the drilling mods or, or other things is, a, is an important aspect of this. The islands isotopes is really a, a novel thing, and this is a, a publication that just came out from Amy Wallace and her her uh, colleagues, and, um, and you can see this uh, in more detail, see this, get it in more detail, um, uh, in a talk uh, that she'll have in session six. And the thing about islands is, is they're like uh, uh, onions, you know, you can, they're, they're in layers. And so the deeper you go into the islands, that basically is uh, earlier in the life history of the animal. And the nice thing is you can, unlike otoliths, you can actually track things like nitrogen composition in these tissues. And so you, in a sense, get a recorder of that as well. So I talked a little bit about the development of new uh, planning tools. Um, one of the um, uh, sets of data that we have access to is the CMAP um, data um, that NOAA uh, collects along with the states uh, from 1982 to present. So um, what we've done is to uh, overlay the surface expression of the oil spill with the historical CMAP data set. And so, for example, in this uh, inset, you can see the um, fraction of uh, different populations, um, larval uh, production that were within the oil spill um, uh, footprint during the period of time when the oil was there. And so speckled trout was high and some of the other ones are lower. Uh, and we've continued this on to basically put together a planning model. So this represents two hypothetical oil spills um, uh, at the same time for the same duration, one in the western uh, um, uh, Gulf of Mexico uh, off, off Houston, basically, and then uh, one in the eastern Gulf of Mexico uh, off Tampa. And uh, if you want to see what those results are, and they're very exciting, I suggest you go see Emily Chancellor's talk. So. I said before that you know one of the major things that we want to do is to try to understand the interaction between far field modeling and um, and the um, the microprocesses that are going on in the near field. And so um, this um, so-called CMS, the Connectivity Modeling System, has been put together to try to tie in some of the near field to the far field tracking uh, and understand some of these dynamical processes. And in terms of what we've learned from this. Um, First of all, we've learned that uh, high pressure biodegradation is very important to the outcomes in terms of the for plume formation and exactly where these plumes settle, right? So what we've learned is that the parameterization of these models with lab-based um, high pressure degradation rates improves these predictions of, the, the, for example, in this case, the southwestern plume development. 
Um, and to sort of uh, continue on this uh, uh, chemical dispersant theme, we've learned that subsea disbursement injection may have little effect on the amount of oil that ultimately surfaces. And th again, this is a highly controversial uh, result. And I think ultimately trying to get better lab data and models is going to hopefully um, resolve the controversy that we have. Um, as you can see from this graphic and the, and the data we have here, you can create, uh, depending on the degree of turbulence that you create in these, uh, in these experiments, you can actually create um, droplet sizes that would simulate uh, droplets that would be uh, neutral in suspension. And that's a very important result. The real issue here is scaling up the turbulence that we can see in this, um, this um, cell to the actual turbulence that you had at the wellhead. And uh, so we've got a number of other experiments that are ongoing to simulate uh, what's going on in, in high pressure environments. Um, on the left here is basically the high pressure cell that is in Hamburg, and it's basically a long tube that we can inject uh, um, uh, gases and oil in the bottom of the tube and understand the dispersion of dynamics. Um, and as well, there's a, uh, a partitioning um, uh, apparatus at Calgary that allows us to understand how um, the constituents in oil partition into the dissolved phase into um, the water and so, you know, therefore be, being carried, you know, as uh, not droplets but dissolved forms of many of these chemicals. So uh, in terms of uh, overall, um, we've learned a lot about partitioning into small droplets, which as Tomai said is very critical. We've learned a lot about partitioning of some of these compositions, and we've also learned that um, depending on the pressure and temperature, you can create vastly different genomes of the, um, of the microconstituents that are there in terms of pressure effects. So um, the sort of um, last big bit I want to talk about, and I'll be done here, is um, in terms of the major sediment discoveries by CMH and uh, obviously other colleagues as well. Um, this is uh, the, the surface um, expression uh, in McDonald's work. And based on the NERDA data that, that Rick Spinrad talked about, um, we've actually used those data to model what the difference in PAH concentration was right at the surface of the sediment versus the next layer down, which was pre-spill. And so what you see here is a graphic where there's a substantial increase, and these um, red areas are like 200% increase over the baseline, um, and that it seems to be very differential and, and in some sense working its way down that slope. Um, and this is confirmed by a number of coring studies that we've done that are, that are dated um, in terms of you know, that, that sequence as well. Uh, uh, as far as the overall level of sediment accumulation, prior to the oil spill, the sediment accumulation rate was down here. These are accumulation rates at different uh, spots uh, up and down the DeSoto Canyon. So you can see that after the spill, it relaxed, but it hasn't gone back down to the, the pre-spill rate yet. And what we think is happening is that there's a slow avalanche of this, uh, of this flocculate material that's coming down slope, and it's actually you know, resulting in, in some cases, um, not a relaxation in a, in a very direct way. So um, in terms of our next steps on sediment and fish, we'll continue to monitor the recovery of these sediments and biota because we're not there yet. Uh, we want to extend our field studies in CMH2 to the Ixtox spill area and basically create a tale of two spills. We think there's a lot to learn from a spill 35 years ago that basically was on the same order of magnitude. We want to conduct uh, Gulf-wide fish surveys to help develop this broad baseline, which would be of enormous value not only to us but to others in the future. We want to do controlled exposures to uh, calibrate some of the sublethal effects we're seeing in the fish. And we want to extend the, our modeling studies to understand the, uh, all of the factors that are contributing to MOFSA, trophic effects, and, and response. So with that, I want to say that um, I want to emphasize that um, research innovation is, is one of our, our keystones, and we think it's uh, transformational. And, and lastly, I'd like to thank the board for the faith that they've had in, in CMH, and we mu very much appreciate it. Thank you.